So please keep this in mind when it comes to posing questions later. Now, in terms of format, Dr. Dutta and myself will be chatting in about 45, for about 45 minutes or so. And the conversation will then be open up for Q&A for around 15 minutes before we close at Singapore time, 11.30 a.m. So welcome again, everyone, and to a student-led conversation series where Echo de Pons EDBA graduates are being interviewed by EDBA candidates. Now for clarity's sake, EDBA stands for Executive Doctorate in Business Administration. It's different from a traditional PhD in that an EDBA is designed for professionals such as myself and Dr. Dutta, who wish to marry their work experience with academic rigor. What this means is that as practitioner scholars, we research topics or problems that we observe are happening in the course of our professional lives. And we hope to discover practical solutions that are firmly grounded in rigorous research methodologies. My name is Roslina Chai. I'm an EDBA candidate with Echo de Pont, who is hopefully graduating in a few months. I'm also your host for our very first conversation where Dr. Raja Dutta and myself will be talking about his research topic on the role that Indian SMEs play when partnering with multinational enterprises in India, as well as what the last three years was like for him completing his EDBA while making dessert, fretworking, painting, and doing photography. And let's not forget about working full-time. Welcome, Dr. Raja Tuta, and thank you for agreeing to kickstart this conversation series with us. Thank you. Thank you, Roslina, and uh, thank you for everyone in the Ecole de Pont School for actually letting us do this, because it's a very student-led initiative, mm. like you mentioned. But I think this is a very good initiative in terms of it just let, let all of us uh, discover how we have been progressing in the EDBA journey. And then for anyone who kind of is joining this webinar, also to understand a little bit about what a EDBA is all about and you know how one can also pursue the journey if they're interested in. So I think it's going to be a good purposeful discussion for the current students and also for anyone who is interested in a program like this uh, in yeah. the future. So Dr. Dutta, I'm gonna start with the first billion dollar question, which all of us in the EDA program absolutely hates to love, love to hate, I don't know which one. So could you describe your research for us in two to three lines? Yeah, sure. So uh, like you rightly, very, very nicely framed in the beginning in terms of uh, an EDBA is a very practical approach. So, mm like over my last uh, 15, 16 years of work experience across different industries, and most of it has been in emerging markets, primarily in India. Mm. There are three areas where I have been increasingly curious about. One is mm -hmm. just the nature of emerging market economies and how it is different from more developed economies. The second piece is uh, the increasing and valuable role that small and, small and medium enterprises play in an emerging economy. Uh, like across industries i have seen that like in cpg retail sales and distribution manufacturing etc and mm. the third piece has been the multinational enterprise and the small and medium enterprise linkage so over these last 15 odd years what i have seen is these three things kept on coming back in different facets of work but my my observation was that the industry follows a very unstructured or fragmented approach in dealing with these relationship Mm -hmm. However, I also observe that this connection of multinationals and SMEs are super important. Like they, 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 we, we kind of live with it on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of how to run the business. But there was no concrete literature or the way it has been approached in the industry was something I felt that uh, is not very organized. And at the back of my mind, I was also curious for a doctoral program like this. So mm. when, I, when I joined, I figured out that this is the area where I would really like, love to see and if I can frame my research papers. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons like I was very eager on Equal de Pons uh, EDBA program is because it also allows us the three paper approach. Mm. And, uh, and I was very eager to actually touch two or three areas, uh, very, very preferably from a implementation centric viewpoint. And this, this allowed me to take three facets. One in the first paper was purely mm -hmm. looking at the multinational enterprises 
and small and medium enterprises and how they can synergize. And then the second one was an integrative literature review, deep diving into the frugal innovation aspect and how MNEs and SMEs have both a critical role in making it successful for future. Mm -hmm. So these were the two critical aspects. The third paper I would, not, I would, I would maybe park for, our, for the remaining part of our conversation. Okay, so we're gonna come back to the three paper approach, but I think it would be very helpful um, for you to share why it's important for this topic to be researched. You did mention that you are curious, you love it. You mentioned the fragmentation, the disconnection, but from an industry perspective, why do you think it's important? Yeah, absolutely. So there are uh, there are two aspects to it, like both sides mm -hmm. of the coin. So let's say mm -hmm. one side of the coin is the side of the multinational enterprises. Mm -hmm. So when multinational, like it's it's inevitable that increasingly more and more multinational enterprises will work in emerging market economies, and they are already mm -hmm. doing so in in big numbers. Mm -hmm. And emerging market economy itself is a very thorough concept. You know, it's kind of evolving like literally by every year and I think more active research in terms of how emerging market economy attributes are critical have been happening over the past two decades. Mm -hmm. And so it's very recent in a, in a, in a research academia framework, two decades is actually quite recent, but there are some new perspectives like institutional theory and institution based view. These are the kind of economic theories, which are getting increasingly used to understand emerging market economies. Now, in this research, why I think it's very critical is for multinational enterprises when they enter EMEs and want to establish businesses, it's not a level playing field or a very clearly transparent field as they are used to in developed markets. And it's also not a one size fits all. What I mean by that, the emerging market economy aspect of work, setting up a business in India may not be same as setting up a business in Malaysia or Vietnam. It will be drastically mm. different. Mm. But this research framework at least allows the multinational enterprises to look at some common eight or nine blocks in which they can assess entering an emerging market economy and what they should be careful about in terms of the different institutions that they need to deal with. For example, labor market institutions or regulatory institutions or education institutions or competition institutions, etc. So that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is small and medium enterprises for the, for the decades ahead of us, will continue to play a very important role in emerging mm -hmm. market economy. Just because the population densities are huge, the markets are fragmented, it is not a very well-organized, structured market, let's say, like what we see in the US or in the UK. And mm -hmm. to the best of my understanding, it will it is expected to stay like that because of the mm -hmm. size and the density mm -hmm. and, the, and the geographic spread, etc. So SMEs mm -hmm. will continue to play an important role. But SMEs are also not as organized as multinationals. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of room for education in terms of when they want to partner with multinational enterprises, what are the different things that they should keep in mind in their forming stage, which is in the initial stage of the business, and then in the norming stage, which is like wherein you know they've just started engaging with the multinational enterprises, and then in the final stage wherein they are looking for a continuity. So a research like this also gives a very good scope of them that when they go and talk to multinational enterprises, how do they say that what are the values that they add to the business? Like, mm. what do I add in the labor market institutional area? What do I add in the legal institutional area? You know, so, so I think this study in which at least the, the aspiration with which I did this is when a company wants to enter and engage mm. with smaller medium enterprises, it can be done in a much more meticulous way both from the side of MEs as well as the side of small and medium enterprises. And I don't want to call out specific organizations, but of all the six or seven organizations, which are all MEs, I have personally seen, and they are of massive size. I see, I have seen through my experience that this is not happening. Like mm. we, we take, well, like it, it's taken in a much more transactional way, you know, like you want to do a deal, just call a local distributor and get it done. Or you want to do some logistics, know a guy you know and just get it done so it's very transactional so that was mm -hmm. primarily the aspiration of this research that can i create a framework wherein it can be approaching both sides of the coin which is the side of MEs as well as the side of SMEs. okay so 
just off the top of your head, I think for those of us um, who are in corporate, who had been in corporate and have worked at the strategic level, one of the things, at least from my perspective, is there is a degree of reactiveness um, to how we try to make strategic decisions, partially because time is always, you know, a big unavailable resource to be stretched infinitely. But there is also a tendency um, for people to rely on reports from the top five, top 10 consulting firms. Uh, I just heard one a couple of days ago. So I'm very curious, um, given this is a world you're currently in and you just completed a really tough EDBA program, what do you think is the difference or the value between these two different kind of approaches uh, of research for the purpose of strategic decision making? Well, this is like a uh, this is a like really really good question. So, mm. you know the I mean you are so spot on. So the I think the big challenge is. Uh, without naming any multinational enterprises when they when they enter an emerging market economy they a they see the opportunity right because obviously you see the opportunity there's tremendous amount of revenue opportunity or business growth opportunity and mm. the other thing that they think is they they have the power of resource based view which is like everything inside the company which is i have resources i have assets which are all valuable which are not inimitable uh, Sorry, which are not which are not imitable. So basically, they think they are inimitable, etc. But the thing is, there is a lot which is outside of the company. So mm -hmm. that there's a tendency of discovering when a company actually lands in an emerging market economy, and mm -hmm. that's where the, the angle of reactive reaction comes in because then you are already there and you have to take some decisions. So there is a very quick, you know, tactical engagement, reviewing a few existing consulting reports or maybe even getting hold of a consulting firm and trying to just say that, oh, this sales and distribution strategy is not working or that manufacturing strategy is not working. How, mm. how can we make it work, et cetera. Mm. From this research, I like if I really look back about, about my personal learning, like if I have to enter a new market now, like luckily in my work, I also work with emerging markets. Let's say as an example, if I want to enter an emerging market economy now, I will actually take a bit of a pause. I will not rush. Because it's really hard. Like there are large CPG brands, there are large technology brands who have entered emerging market economies of the size of India or China mm. and exited them six or seven times. Mm. So instead of saying that, I will rather you know delay my decision, even if it is required by a year, but mm. really go through that. You know what are the different aspects that I should be really careful about in terms of how is the labor market institution in this market. How is the legal mm. institution in this market? One big aspect that everybody misses is the socio-cultural institution. How deep mm. is that in this market? You know, how will the consumers react in this market, et cetera, et cetera. So mm. I think that is a big difference approach I will take in terms of not being reactive, not being like rushing to launch and then figuring out how can I make things like make ends meet by doing a quick consulting report check or, or calling somebody to see that, you know, this sales is not working, this sales strategy is not working, how can we make it work? Because it will not work. Like, mm. uh, I can say that with some amount of confidence because of all the literature I was scanning, mm. the, the, the academics are saying that it will not work. You cannot make it happen. Like, you know, if you're not understanding why will an Indian consumer or a Vietnamese consumer or a Nigerian consumer buy a thing, you cannot make some small tweaks and suddenly make things happen. Hmm. So even though it's not strictly part of this conversation, um, but one of the things that really jumped out at me as I was talking to you about your research is integrity. So what do I mean by this? And I'd like to invite your reflection. Um, the way that most m &Es are structured in terms of um, career development it's very rare for any decision maker to be in a role for more than three years, which means that the long tail of the uh, decision in terms of impact sometimes is felt maybe two or three promotion rounds later. But because as you've said, um, MNEs are buffered by a lot of the perception of resources, 
there are layers of complexity that just kind of adds on and on and on. And when somebody new comes in, they have to make a decision really quick. They don't have the capacity, nor the luxury, nor the um, willingness at times to look at the long cycle of impact. And that is one thing that I, at least from my perspective, academic research really, really grounds you in that longitudinal perspective. But that longitudinal perspective is only useful if there's also integrity in the data set. So my jaw literally dropped when you told us that you called cold email or called over a thousand companies just to make sure that your, your sample is robust. So I'm very curious, having gone through that journey, does that impact in any way the way you think about decision making? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, two two parts of it. The first part is not like connected to the to my research. I mean, it's like mm. it, I haven't I haven't addressed that specific piece. Mm. But what you said is actually can actually be a very good uh, topic of research, exactly on the same subject. So you talked mm. about the longitudinal scale mm. and uh, like hypothetically, what you are saying is, if somebody approaches an emerging market, a, a, a multinational enterprises approaches an emerging market from a longitudinal mm. scale, which mm. means they are not having to rush on it, they are willing to invest time in it. Mm. There's mm. a higher likelihood of them of the fact that they will do really well in such markets. And I think mm. uh, anecdotally, I, like we should like it, it is a topic of maybe a embedded case study research or maybe a qualitative research, but anecdotally that seems to be very right. For example, yes. like I can talk of a few cases in India, for example, Hyundai as an automobile company is mm -hmm. probably taking this approach. They're taking a long term point of view on the market in terms of mm -hmm. we really want to crack this market. We want to do well in this market. And then maybe this market can also become a, an export hub. There are quite a few technology companies who are doing mm -hmm. the same. Mm -hmm. And one of the oldest solid examples uh, with respect to India is probably Unilever, right? They're investing in India for a long time. And in terms mm -hmm. of that, exactly that longitudinal scale is happening in terms of there is no need to rush. There is no need to shorter cycle of somebody coming in and, you know, giving their stint of two, three years and then moving out into another expat role in some other country. Mm -hmm. Yes, all of that will be happening, but they have a sense of investment that having mm -hmm. local grounded professionals investing their time and energy over a longitudinal time frame. And these are some of the case studies that keep coming in in terms of some of some m &Es who are doing extremely well in an emerging mm -hmm. market. So mm -hmm. I think that's a fascinating topic in terms of picking up three or four such organizations and trying to mm -hmm. just call out the factors that what this did what did these guys do that mm. they become that they became successful so that's i mm. think that's a great idea for somebody's future research <laughs> back to my, future uh, future research um so at some yeah. level it sounds like what you're saying is there is a intersection the perfect marriage between uh the longitudinal and the the sheer sample size that academic research demands if it's married with the practice-based consulting approach, there is something interesting that is yet to be discovered. Okay. Yeah. So as a practitioner scholar and, and you're living and breathing this MNE in emerging markets and SMEs reality, and you actually learn a lot on the work, right? So there is huge value in learning on the job, but I'm curious, if you think there is something that you discovered and that you learned about your job, your industry, uh, that would not have been possible had you not done this EDBA, what would that one thing or one to three things that you've learned? Well, absolutely. So like, first of all, uh, the the second part of your question in terms of approaching you know like writing to thousand plus small and medium enterprise stakeholders trying to see if they are willing to mm. respond to my questionnaire etc mm. and quite a few of them did which led to us analyzing the data and then mm. making the paper so what mm. i uh, 
what i learned is massive so definitely like in spite of you know living and breathing and working in an emerging market setup and mm-hmm. uh, and for a fairly long stint like currently the the role i am in i'm trying to work on in consumer hardware trying to establish sales and distribution mm. and business in an emerging market setup like for markets mm. like india thailand indonesia mm. etc even i did not consider on a conscious level i just think of two or three things but as mm. part of this edba journey like you know that is what i was trying to say in the first part of the conversation that even somebody like a practitioner who is passionate about this topic on a day to day basis i would just generally scratch on the surface like these are the three or four things we should do this is how we should mm-hmm. approach why we mm-hmm. need a local player why we need a local small and medium enterprise and mm-hmm. mostly our approach is transactional that's because they can help us close the last mile or they can help us you know distribute things a little easier than if we wanted to do so mm-hmm. but when i read in more details about institution based view in my, as a professional i never did that right because i joined the edba program and i was supposed to produce this i started reading more mm-hmm. more and researching more that's when i figured out that institution is such a lo- is such a worst topic it me to actually frame those questions so much more that smes can do rather than just closing some last mile transactional things for us right which even in spite of working in this industry probably i never probed in depth and and the fear point right even the organization sometimes do not allow you that bandwidth also to probe into that depth because you are always trying to chase something mm. i think that's why at least i don't know whether we'll be able to make the changes but at least personally it is very fulfilling that when i'm looking at setting up a new business or entering a new market now at least personally i know that hey there these are not just the two or three things mm. and in the edba approach that you know these are seven or eight classic equipments that i can use to make my entry or exit from the market successful whichever okay. case okay okay so one last question before we move into exploring your personal journey with uh, the edba and i know it's going to be a tough question so you know good luck because three years there's a lot that you've learned and you've just intimated on but if you could just give one takeaway for a decision maker in a similar position as you what would that one takeaway be like something they can think about or do that would make a difference in how they think about mnes and smes in india yeah i would say that uh, if you are an mne and if you are looking to work with a small and medium enterprises mm-hmm. uh, in emerging markets do not approach it transactionally there is mm-hmm. much more that small and medium enterprises can contribute in an mm-hmm. mne engagement mm-hmm. like do not underestimate the value that these guys can bring from a strategic thinking angle it's mm-hmm. not a bunch of uh, stakeholders who can only solve the last mile and who are only tactical they mm-hmm. they can contribute in the strategic road map planning for a multinational enterprises if the mnes are willing to do it properly and nicely in fact there is a professor called uh, professor shamim prashantham he is now teaching in uh, china europe international business school ceibs Uh, in 2008 or 9 he wrote a nice article in california business review which is which mm. says uh, dancing with the gorillas where in obviously the gorillas are multinational enterprises and when he says dancing with the gorillas he means sme is dancing with the gorillas and mm. recently just about this year he actually wrote a second part of the book which says gorillas can dance <laughs> so he kept it and i think that's amazing because that's what is required probably because if multinational enterprises are willing to bring in an angle of flexibility mm-hmm. which is where gorillas can dance angle comes in so it, it mm-hmm. doesn't need to be always dancing with gorillas it also can be gorillas can dance and i think that's when magical outcome can happen so if you are representing the gorillas which is large <laughs> companies 
please be a little flexible to dance and you know like just see how you can involve with the SMEs early stage or if you are SMEs uh, then try to make the gorillas which is the multinational enterprises uh, explain the value that they can add and you know kind of invite them to dance with you uh, to make the journey a little better okay so I'm not sure if uh, those are MNEs were expecting to be compared to gorillas, but I rather like the image because I think you're right, gorillas can dance, but sometimes they have to pay for a dancing coach or something. <laughs> yeah. So as we kind of uh, intimated earlier, 1,000 emails plus plus, call emails and calling on top of everything else you had to do while working full time, Tell us, Dr. Duta, what in the world possessed you to start an EDVA journey? What were you thinking? <laughs> yeah, that's a fantastic question. So my, uh, in all honesty, I have, I have a massive interest in academics. In, uh, mm. When I mentioned that, like, I'm very eager that a certain part of uh, my work journey, like, I would love to get involved with the business school in a academic uh, responsibility, primarily mm -hmm. teaching preferably to uh, undergrad or MBA candidates, etc. Mm -hmm. And while, you know, doing a little bit of research in that, I figured out that many of the good schools prefer to have somebody who have a, a doctorate qualification just so that uh, in their faculty, I mean, so because they probably they're looking for somebody who is a little more engaged in the activity or who probably wants to Probably they try to look at how serious I am as a candidate because there are a lot of people who might want to teach. So the, it started from there. And I was thinking that how should it be? Should it be a full-time one? Should it be a part-time one, et cetera? Mm, and mm. I was researching about the programs. I honestly mm -hmm. did not even know that there are such structured programs which have started evolving now. For me, a doctorate uh, always was a full-time thing. But as I started researching, I figured out there are options like the, mm. the EPA program that Equal the Bonds have created. Mm. And that's when I, the other thing that I always had a notion was it is always six, seven years. So uh, that, the thought of, you know, working and then doing this for six, seven years was also quite intimidating. But there's been some yeah. research I figured out that it can be done in four years. And if we speed up a little bit, can sometimes be also done in three years. So that was the primary motivation that if I can get this done, probably I can start planning about my next phase wherein I am really eager to get into a teaching or faculty kind of a mode, maybe some, for some time part time and if it works out well, I can also get into it full time. So that was the key motivation. And when, and when I decided that I will get into this, I really wanted to connect it back to what I do. Hmm. Like, to, to the point that you first mentioned at the start of this conversation, because hmm. I thought that there is no way I can get this done if I don't if I'm not able to connect it back to my current profession, because that's mm -hmm. when only I will have some level of energy, you know, to learn more, to understand more, and maybe hopefully to apply in my job. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the decision making. And mm -hmm. uh, while there were quite a few other programs, which uh, are all there nowadays, a lot of, uh, you know, executive doctorate in business administration programs, the specific equal funds program was very attractive to me just because it allows us that three paper approach. So I mm. thought that A, I will get a chance to work on it, which I can connect back to my work experience. And B, I can also look at maybe two or three different subjects uh, mm. under the same umbrella of emerging markets. So these mm. two choices I found very, very attractive, which led to this, uh, to this journey. Mm. So can you speak a little bit more as to why you chose the three paper approach? Uh, so for those who are listening, uh, Echo de Pomme gives you the option of doing one paper, which is more like the traditional PhD, or three papers uh, using three different methods to explore three different facets of an overarching topic. So, and um, the program director usually say, at some point, regardless of what approach you take, it will be difficult. So choose your own poison. So can you tell us why you chose a three paper poison approach? Yeah. So uh, 
specifically i was very eager on uh, three things one is uh, from my past uh, mba qualifications etc i have always been a big fan of teaching case studies so i i love teaching cases like uh, the, the the business schools where i went they followed the case methodology approach and mm. lots of people from iv uh, from mm. ncr from hbs mm. so that approach mm. i really like it and what mm. i figured out is that one of the three papers can be where you can actually write a teaching case so for me that was mm. like a big point of attraction i was like wow so i always liked solving teaching cases reading teaching cases but getting mm. uh a skill wherein i can actually think of writing a teaching test that's amazing so that was one like huge point of attraction mm. the second thing is coming very close to my topic which is uh, emerging market economics so mm. there are quite a few areas right where i'm interested and i'm mm. i'm still interested in more areas like you you just mentioned like brought in a such a nice topic earlier today which is the longitudinal approach and picking up a few companies so mm. that that's already a very interesting topic like mm. so when i figured out that i'm getting an option to do like three uh, three paper approach one i will park aside for the teaching case but the other two i can at least pick two areas under the same aspect of emerging market economies the mne sme linkage and a little bit more of an additional focus on smes can mm. i do a couple of things so that's mm. when i was very eager instead of choosing just one paper i mm. took one which is more of deep diving into the mne sme linkage piece which which ended up becoming a quant paper and mm. the other paper which uh, which i think is a vast research area which is frugal innovation mm. and uh, i still think that frugal innovation academic research has just about started i mean mm. it it has started hitting the publications etc from as early as 2012 13 you know so it's been just 7 8 years so i thought mm. it will be amazing if i can work on a paper in that specific area so that mm. was instantly the high level thinking that can i do something like that but obviously in the first year uh, the curriculum is so well designed that you can actually frame your thinking that if you mm. thought what you wanted to do versus if what you will actually do does mm. it make sense so So the first year actually helped me like crystallize them a little bit more but it purely came from these two specific aspects one is uh, edba from an angle of if i can do it i can get into academia and then b if i do it can i do it in some in more than one topics where i have uh, interest from a professional standpoint yeah so it sounds like it really gave you the opportunity not only to diversify but to diversify in a way that is still really grounded so that you can come to your topic from multiple perspectives and you yeah. also had an opportunity to experiment with different academic research methods which may not be the case if you went for just one specific angle so you feel that gives you it makes you a fuller practitioner scholar from that perspective Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Because that, and we are not even, you know, we are not even full-time academics. I think that's a huge opportunity, right? If you do two or three things, at least mm. in this in this journey, you mm. end up experiencing what is a qualitative paper, or what is a quantitative paper, what is a integrative mm. literature review. So mm. that that's a great point. Like it just gives us in this journey to also adapt and learn three or four things. Uh, mm -hmm. while a one paper approach may actually help us deep dive into one specific area and become like a full specialist mm -hmm. uh, in a sense i probably took the generalist path where i know a little bit about two or three methodologies yeah so you may have a uh, touch on this but could you in a very short uh sentence share how you have changed as a professional and or a personal human being as a result of this edba like what did it bring to your life yeah I, like personally i think that uh, and i think many of us who are doing this can also add to this point i think it adds a lot of value in in multiple facets like 
one is uh, the sense of planning like before even i go into the research specific topics i mean it just needs a lot of planning your day like uh, mm -hmm. like specifically the ecole de ponce edba program has a couple of modules which is led by professor morizio who comes in and talks about not specific topics of research but he just trains the students in terms of how should we approach this program from a cadence standpoint from a yeah. frequency standpoint from a time yeah. management standpoint and he is very tangible in his call outs that if you don't yeah. do it you will not finish it like he keeps on saying two things in his classes which is what will you do so that you will finish and then immediately he says the opposite else you will not finish like he keeps <laughs> on saying that to an extent because and he does this session before even any uh, like you know structured session starts so the new students think that uh, what is like why is he saying two things repeatedly like either you will finish or you will not finish but then as you go into the journey you figure out as you reflect in his classes that he is so right so i think the first thing it has given me is structure we, like and now that the program is done i can tell with a lot of confidence that the structure has not gone like mm. i have really started valuing the day plan the day much nicer because the small uh, disciplines that came in the life that okay you have one hour so you can read five pages of a paper and you can try to summarize that in 50 60 words because you have only one hour and you can do only this much after that there's another meeting or some other personal uh, meeting etc cetera, etc cetera. so that is a big change in terms of managing the time like being respectful of your own schedule and uh, just making sure that we progress that is also very mm -hmm. critical like in the first three or four months i struggled a lot i was reading a lot but not probably writing too much and then i figured out that i was not progressing at all mm. uh, the dba program has helped me discipline that aspect a lot uh, the second piece is uh, the angle of curiosity like uh, while in a corporate uh, boundary like you mentioned we are sometimes rushed for decisions or rushed for like a presentation etc but mm. i mean there are just certain tools which have i have become a little more comfortable in reading them than 3 years back which is google scholar is something i will not refer to in my day to day work but now i feel uh, i can uh, it's mm. not that as scary as i used to think i go to google scholar and if i want to search on servant leadership there are two or three papers and each paper has a nice conclusion each paper has a nice introduction mm. so it's not that bad i can still learn a little bit more rather than doing you know a normal random image search or a random presentation search in google so that that's yes. another approach that probably more deeper curiosity and mm. uh, and then also trying to fit it back to the corporate world with simplicity because you cannot mm. use the academic language back to your colleagues because then they will not be interested so that aspect has also been taught in this program that if you are like doing a research how can you convey that to the recipients in a way that they understand it right mm -hmm. like so person managing my personal schedule number one number two a larger level of curiosity and number mm -hmm. three just not being shy to deep dive on a topic a little more than i used mm -hmm. to in the past mm -hmm. so on the delectable note um This is on a very deeply personal level. Apart from the pastries and the croissants, what really stands out for you in terms of memory? So when I joined the program, one of the things that uh, I was very excited about is the program will let me go to Paris very frequently. So. Uh, that itself was a big energy of going doing this program yes while it happened it could have been much more if the pandemic was not there mm. uh, i think i could have easily made another three or four trips but still it was not bad i ended up doing a few quite a few trips the second thing is uh, one thing i was amazed by is the range of uh, participants we have and uh, in a way i was a bit lucky because i got a chance to Uh, sit with the participants of EDBA four, obviously, which is my batch. And then, uh, since I missed one module in my batch, I did that module with 
EDBA5. So I got actually a range of knowing and uh, meeting around 50 people, right? And I was amazed with the with the vast experience, the, the places where they come from, their positions, mm -hmm. like extremely senior people, like like highly respectful candidates. So that was a big learning. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of engagement in these with this with all of these folks outside of the you know 10 hour class every day because mm -hmm. there will be a catch up in the evening or there will be a nice nice lunch break, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So that is a big takeaway. I think that network is massive. I mean, huge scope to learn. Just meeting, interacting with them, there are different aspects which I don't get to see in my day-to-day -day work. I think that's one big piece. The second thing is uh, just being in a completely different cultural setup while doing this learning, very varied professors, like the school has a network of professors who just don't belong to that school. They come from other universities, et cetera, et cetera, which was a big takeaway. And uh, one interesting memory is uh, how challenging was the Viva hosted for me. Uh, like uh, that is also a memory which I'll keep because uh, it was pretty rigorous. Like I thought that the papers are approved, it's done. I'll I'll now go for a nice one hour Viva and I think it will be nice and warm. But it was just not that. Uh, some, some folks had warned me that please prepare well and, uh, and luckily, thank God I did because it was a pretty high decibel activity. And so it will stay as one of the memories of these three years. Mm. Last question. Um, you have an amazing creative side, which actually stems. Um, I remember the story you shared from a science class. So you're Fred working, you're painting, your photography. Uh, I'm not sure how dessert making kind of fits into this, but the way that you create artistic designs do you see um, any connection, any relevance, interconnection with the way that you create the concepts, the frameworks, the academic side of things? Is it for you related? And if so, how do you think they actually feed one another? Yeah, no, great question. I think the, the, the most common word is curiosity. Like, uh, like if you see on the on the personal side, there are at least four or five things I'm very interested about. Like even on painting, trying different forms like watercolor, pastel, charcoal, oil, mm. Uh, mm. fret working, and fret working also again uh, different forms of fret working. Like like not just limiting to one dimension of the work, but trying to do 3D models of architectural buildings or trying to do a flower vase or trying to do a lampshade. Sometimes even trying to do window frames, uh, which I did for my home back in Calcutta. But just the curiosity, because uh, in many of them, honestly, the outcome is not the best, but the curiosity of trying something new, uh, that probably connects back to the academic interest also. Like, uh, again, these topics were something that I was not aware of. Uh, but I was curious about, and uh, it was easy for me to actually just deep dive on the Quan paper and convert it into a full thesis. Uh, when I was interacting with my supervisor, he did say that it can be done because it's a vast topic. Mm -hmm. But I was very curious on the frugal innovation topic, which led me to work on the integrated literature review. So it was a mm -hmm. little, it was more painful to create a completely new paper with with not much of a commonality with the quant paper, mm. but the curiosity for you know pursuing that journey is is probably the main reason, and I think that uh, that plays in my professional uh, career also. The jobs that I've chosen are also, uh, I think the uh, underlying framework will be still curiosity because, like I worked in energy sector, consulting, mm. uh, information systems, which is software. Uh, digital advertising, consumer hardware, telecom, mm. like these are very, very different industries. Uh, mm. It has its pros and cons, like too much of curiosity of moving into these diverse companies. Uh, you have to really mm. convince people that this guy is serious about what he wants to do. But 
but in a way i think i like uh, the, the frameworks knowing mm. different industries understanding different kinds of people uh, going back to your question probably this was one of the reason why i could approach 1000 people in small and medium enterprises because of this experience of working in five or six industries like i mm. just knew a bunch of people mm. i think curiosity always expands horizon i i have seen that in my hobbies as well as on the work side mm. that is a very very famous last word so i'm going to close uh for about 30 seconds and give the attendees a time to think about what questions they might want to ask you and we invite the attendees to actually speak um but if whatever reason you can't speak please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box so your famous last word curiosity expands the horizon um i also hear from your description um creativity and i don't know if you agree that the academic journey is actually a horribly terribly um creative approach which requires you to be really comfortable or having to find a way to be comfortable with uncertainty uh because it is goddamn uncertain and i remember my supervisor telling me of course it's uncertain it's supposed to be uncertain otherwise you're not discovering anything right So if I could describe you in three words before we open up to the attendees curiosity creativity and the ability to just dance not as a gorilla maybe with uncertainty Yeah <laughs> Yeah so uh attendees please um uh, I Joanne they don't need to unmute themselves right they can just pop in and ask questions Uh yes they can just pop in and ask questions. Okay. Yes. Olivia, please. Um well, I'm in the middle of the journey. And the, my biggest takeaway so far because I started a year ago is mm -hmm. really thinking out of the box and that ability to look at situations, things decision making just and judgment um through another lens and it's not just being on the balcony but it's really you know pushing that you know higher cognitive level into mm. another sphere that mm. you wouldn't necessarily think about before the journey mm. Do you have a question there Olivia or are you just sharing your reflections? Oh well I'm sharing my reflections but I'm also uh. putting it out there and to what do you would that does that would that experience did you guys have that experience or is there anything other or another vision or another lens? Okay. No like you gave an analogy that is so spot on you mentioned about A, you are on the balcony, and in this specific journey, uh, probably we need to get down and you know, like, start rolling up the sleeves and trying to do more research, read more, trying to contribute more. And to Rosalina's point, that that angle of creativity, right? Because something new needs to, like, some new dimension needs to be added by all of us who are doing this. So I think that uh, the, the initial phase is. or when all of us start we are probably at the balcony like in the first 6 months and we are thinking that oh i need to like actually go down and start working on this and there's a little bit of discomfort that can i should i how should i go? like from the balcony i know that yeah this is fantastic this these are the different researches that are there can i do it because for me to do it i cannot like stand as a spectator anymore i need to go down and start reading start writing and putting my point of view and i think that's where that angle of final creativity comes in like i remember asking my supervisor when i was doing the quant paper it was going well i was sending him a few versions he was appreciating so one day i was a little curious and i asked him when do you think it should be done and he just gave it back to me very hard he said i have no clue it may never get done at all <laughs> so <laughs> i was like oh wow that is that's a that's a very you know inspiring reply and that's that
that's it. After that, I never asked anyone else when will it get done because that was a huge learning for him saying that never ask that question again to anyone you are writing an academic paper when it will get done because you never know. There's a high likelihood it might never get done at all. So I, I totally agree on that approach that this is a paper where we cannot, this is an approach where you cannot stand at the balcony and just feel that, you know, it will get done. It's a pretty re rigorous, thought provoking program and we need to get down into the garden or wherever it is that we are watching from the market. Thank you. Hi, Raja. Hey, Sanaj. Hi, Sanaj. Yeah, I have a question to you, Raja. Uh, so the, the thing is, uh, when you had uh, three different approaches for three different papers, uh, how did you go navigate to, through the literature and the theoretical framework? Because probably you are navigating three different courses. Or do you, do you uh, did you have a common thread between them, or these were entirely three different areas of investigation? Uh, there were some commonalities. For example, the institutional theory and the institution-based view was a common framework because I, I had like all my three papers were on the grounds of uh, emerging market economy. But there were new aspects as well, right? For example, in frugal innovation, it's a very different topic. So there were different, like lots of areas around the frugal innovation and Jugaad. Like there are different forms of frugal innovation, grassroots innovation, which I had to work on. And uh, because it was an innovation topic, my supervisor uh, pushed me to start actually from innovation and then narrow down into frugal innovation. So that was, again, a lot of learning. Uh, like I, for example, straight away started from frugal innovation and he said, hang on, hang on, please step back. Let's go back all the way to innovation. And I was like, wow. Like, so from innovation, he narrowed me down to frugal innovation. That itself took some time. But definitely the approaches were different. And the teaching case study uh, was, again, in an emerging market setup. So in the teaching notes, I did bring up aspects of uh, institution-based view, etc. But because it was sales and marketing channels. So there were other frameworks that I referred to. And uh, the teaching case was a live case. So it involved uh, in-depth interviews uh, with the protagonist. Uh, luckily, travel was on. So I could travel to Mumbai a few times to actually meet that person. Uh, it would have been a little difficult had I started that a little later. But yes, okay. it, it, it had, it had okay. different aspects. Sure. To continue with that question, uh, I mean, I don't know how many in the audience would be aware of the three paper scheme, but if I were to put it in a certain way, uh, if we were, I have the order in which I think you did the papers, probably you did the quant first, and then you did the uh, teaching case, and then you moved on to the ILR. Uh, because, I mean, I've been interacting with you as on a personal level too, uh, gathering information on how to handle these papers. So, but my uh, question to you is, would it have been better if you, if we were to do the ILA before the quant, because then what happens, it helps us to frame the theoretical background and use the ILA as the springboard, especially when you do your literature review and things for your final paper. Does that help or do you, uh, do you think there's a specific order or any, you can pursue this three paper in any way we want? My personal opinion is, uh, in my case, it didn't. Uh, matter because it was not exactly a uh, same specific topic, right? I actually digressed from the many SME linkage in the quant paper into frugal innovation. The frugal innovation was primary, and then the many SME linkage became secondary in the third paper. But if you are working on a paper wherein the underlying framework is exactly the same, then I definitely think we should do the ILR first and then followed by that the embedded case study and the qualitative paper. In fact, if somebody is choosing integrative literature review, qual or quant paper, and then embedded case study, let's say these three are chosen, then probably and and if the frame and if the framework is the same, like you will be working on the exactly the same topic, then probably the right ordering is ILR followed by the qual or quant, followed by the embedded case study, because that's where you kind of broaden, then a little bit of narrower in a qual or quant, and then even more specialized in your embedded case study. But if you are uh, having a little bit of flexibility in terms of 
the underlying theme can be same, but you are ta- you are touching different topics. Then I think the order can be fine. Like you can choose teaching case followed by that ILR followed by that polar one. In my case, it was the second aspect, which is I had the same ecosystem in terms of emerging market economies, and then trying to look at the aspects of SMEs and MEs. But I digressed into two different topics, so it, hence it didn't really matter much. So thank you for that. We have time for one last question. Uh, I'm curious if Patrick, uh, you would like to pose a question? Okay. If not, Rosalina, I have one last question. Oh, okay. Um, so Raja, sorry ahead. about that. Yes. Um, oh, it's, wait, it's... sorry. Uh, Olivia, just a quick one. Patrick, okay. I see you've unmuted yourself. Uh, May, if you don't wish to ask a question, please mute yourself. If not, the floor is yours. Otherwise, I'll go over to Olivia. I, I, I'm not at the level that I could really be uh, in a position to uh, make any comments. It was just uh, very interesting to hear and learn of the process that you've gone through. Because I am an SME and the, the, the deepest of the SMEs that you could think of. And I've started in 1974. Wow. Um, and, and I've covered all of this part of the world, including the most difficult was India. <laughs> but, but otherwise, uh, it's been an experience like yours, except mine is not academic. It's uh, right on the floor. And uh, the reason I was uh, also very interested in what uh, I had uh, met uh, Olivia for at that time is uh, the cultural aspect. And that's, you know, the, what she's studying and or what she's able to, uh, we discussed that and there is always a need to understand the cultures that you're going to be working with. And that's not really uh, easily understood by the people who come in from, an SA, from a multinational company. They think that's part. <laughs> Sorry about all this. No, oh, it was that wonderful is... to hear your perspective. Uh, Raja, yeah. please. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, so happy to hear that. Uh, like you are acknowledging the, the 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 different aspects and yes the culture piece is so very critical that i mean i think smes can contribute immensely on understanding uh, the socio sociocultural frameworks in a market where they operate and and add value to the mnes because mnes are mostly coming from outside and again that angle of we will we know it all we'll figure out where exactly. they that doesn't help like they can really lean on SMEs are subject matter experts. Uh, they, don't like pay, they, don't, they don't like to pay for services either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like in a way, SMEs in that way is not only small and medium enterprise, but also subject matter experts. It's kind of kind of the same abbreviation, but they can add a lot of value to the local. Excellent, culture. excellent one. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Olivia, would you like to ask your last question? Yes, I have a very practical question. Raja, mm. how did you deal with the different rabbit holes? The different, you, you know, it's very kind of difficult, especially at the beginning, to not go down rabbit holes and find things that you find really, really interesting. How did you manage to, you know, keep the thread, stay on track, keep the North Star going? So uh, first aspect is uh, the angle of luck, wherein I would say the uh, the angle of luck, because I think I had supervisors who always told me that uh, you need to send me this specific part of your paper by this date. And uh, I kind of acted as a diligent student in terms of trying to send them by that date. And to my surprise, they were unbelievably fast in responding. So basically what was happening is instead of approaching, you know, the progress on a long episode and sending them and then them telling that this is not right, you should go in the left direction or right direction or north or south. They had told me to just send them smaller pieces. Like, uh, like for example, I was working with Professor Nick as my supervisor for the Quan paper and he told me to send uh, the introduction and I was trying to be a little more meticulous. I wanted to send him the introduction and the initial part of literature review. When I sent it to him, he sent it back saying that I told you to send only the introduction. Why did you send me additional stuff? I'll not review. <laughs> so I was like, wow, okay, I get it. 
so so then i sent him only the introduction and then he actually guided me that where all in the introduction things are wrong things are missing what more i should add etc and then i figured out that the approach that he is trying to tell me is that the more you try to do because you are not experienced in the field of academics you will get into rabbit holes just try to follow what i am telling you to do do your introduction and we kind of do multiple reviews so that your introduction is done then we go to the next phase and luckily all the the other two supervisors were also in a very similar framework so a they were giving me shorter aspects to deal with and then they were reviewing them very quickly and very in a very meticulous way and then saying they're saying that let's go to the next one let's go to the next one and sometimes even if you are slow they would send me reminders that you were supposed to send this it was not it where is it it's i haven't received it yet so that aspect also helped me i think i think supervisor does play a pretty integral role in our journey especially because we come as professionals we need that level of nudge i would say not even acute guidance you know because i think we can figure mm-hmm. out our own uh, progress but sometimes those nudges help and exactly to that point olivia the the rabbit hole moments can be avoided you know like doing too much and then sending them and then figuring out it's totally wrong like i i had some such moments in my ilr i went too deep in in my frugal innovation topic and i thought i will impress my supervisor i sent it to him he said no 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 this is like park all of this can you send me a pa- one page on what is innovation as like what <laughs> like that's not even my topic so i figured out that again like i i should not you know try to overdo things because i will get into rabbit holes he just pushed me saying that you need to listen what i am saying and in a very subtle way he actually wrote an email saying that if you if you list if you are willing to listen what i am telling you to do probably we will finish earlier than if you continue to do stuff on your own like this so uh, i think supervisor that's the one line one word answer like following supervisors like and and pray that your supervisors are willing to you know work with you very much very meticulous <laughs> not get upset not get upset with your creativity <laughs> yeah it's offsetting your creativity <laughs> yeah for for, for this you, 3 guys. years i think uh, for this 3 years it's sometimes required to park the creativity side for other aspects like you know if you are doing photography just try to show some creativity there here sometimes just listen to your supervisor on the note of creativity thank you for the questions and thank you for the response um i think it will be wonderful to end on a creative moment that you had with your dessert as a result of escaping from what the, the reference section of the papers you came yeah. up with this new dessert right can yeah. you tell us a little bit about it and if you're willing could you share the recipe in the chat and you can also take the time uh, opportunity to close with any last statement you may have and we will call it a day perfect awesome yeah like i i love desserts and even uh, i don't know if that was one of the strategic reasons of choosing paris as the point of equal the pons edpa but probably it was not so but it ended up in becoming a causality once i landed there uh, but uh, i like desserts and i was working on the bibliography section of my ilr and it was painful like following the apa 7 guidelines and you know trying to look out for the dois and and i was like i need to do something better this evening and i just thought that you know let me park this ilr for the moment and let me try and make a new dessert and i was in singapore and alfonso mangoes were uh, significantly easily available in that season and i thought that let me try and make a a new dessert which was just my like to patrick's point trying to show my creativity because i was not able to show that in the bibliography section uh, and i stepped away from the paper and invested like couple of hours and it turned out to be a pretty good dessert uh, i'll probably ping uh, uh, like how to make it in the in the chat box if some of you are interested uh, yeah. but i think the the last closing note says uh, if there are people who are thinking of pursuing a edba journey there are two things that cross our minds which is it's going to be tiring it's going to be hard it's really long but having gone through this i would say the flip side is actually much more brighter which is 
it is not going to be tiring it might be long yes it is 3 or 4 years but i think the approach is if there is a way you can invest between 60 to 90 minutes in an area where you are interested where you have always been curious and if you can hold on to that 60 to 90 minutes on a daily basis i think this edva can be done in a very very tight and nicely planned timeline of 3 to 4 years and the fulfillment at the end of it is amazing it's 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 very fulfilling for your personal achievement it's very fulfilling from your knowledge standpoint you really learn a lot of structure you get very strong level of enlightenment on an area where you are always interested in but most importantly i think you leave with a bunch of skill sets uh, that will stay on with you forever the biggest mm -hmm. one is if i have 90 minutes how can i make amazing things out of those 90 minutes it it need not be an edba for life right the three years will be an edba but then the fourth year can be something else like how can you make like something magical out of 90 minutes every single day and the reason i'm saying this 90 is because that was kind of prescribed to us by our school that don't park things only for your weekends try to find out 60 to 90 minutes every single day and you will be surprised with the level of progress you make at the end of a month or at the end of a quarter etc and i totally agree with that like uh, i personally try to follow that and it really helps mm. well thank you very much uh dr raja ruta uh, supported by joanne in the background for tech for this conversation the first and what we hope will be a whole host of series student-led and we wish everybody a wonderful day. At this point, the recording shall be stopped.